This video is sponsored by Raycon. I've got to say, it pains me to say it, but Mark's theory about that baby monitor is probably correct. It's the best explanation. No, dude. I switched this off. What? Dude, the machine is switched off. Writer-director Elliot Goldner manages to unearth a sheer amount of unspeakable creepiness from such a simple, rudimentary setting. Get that camera off me! Let's stop the lap! Let's stop the lap! The Borderlands, or more fittingly known in the US as Final Prayer, is perhaps Britain's best and scariest found footage horror film, and not because you'd be hard pressed to find any other British found footage horror to properly compare it to. Many of you have requested this one since the days of Lake Mungo, and now that it's approaching its 10 year anniversary, I want to share with you one of the better and brighter examples of religious horror. That, at first glance, might lead you to suspect it's just another demonic evil spirit spooky house of jump scares, however, buried deep within the pit of its surprisingly Lovecraftian stomach is a subtle, afflicting look at putting evidence to faith, but at the cost of your own sanity. Who's there? Who's there? The Borderlands tells the story of three spiritually distinct men, the agnostic tech specialist Grey, the alcoholic Christian worker Deacon, and the uptight and angsty Father Mark. All you need to remember, Grey, is who's in charge. Huh. The three men are sent on behalf of the Vatican to a small village in Devon to investigate claims of a miracle captured on video during a christening, where the grounds of a several hundred year old recently reopened church begin to mysteriously and violently shake. Father. Their aim is simply to observe and report their findings to determine whether the event was a hoax or in fact indisputable evidence of God's existence. Or perhaps, maybe there's something else entirely. Now, if you've seen any film like this before, there's no point in hiding that yes, supernatural shenanigans do ensue fairly quickly, as strange tremors and sounds begin happening around the church, as the parish priest Father Krellick becomes erratically convinced it's a direct sign from God. The Borderlands isn't groundbreaking by any means, unless you're talking about the literal context of the film way, but trust me, stick with it, because the story is so tightly wrapped around this profoundly scary revelation that left me thinking about it for days. So let's not mess about after we talk about this video sponsor Raycon. Money is tight these days, so making the right investment is more crucial than ever, especially when it comes to finding quality smart tech at reasonable prices. That's why Raycon are looking to disrupt the market by cutting out the premium costs of big brands, but retaining their brilliant sounding quality and tap functionality. For me, Raycon earbuds have persisted the long haul with their solid charging case and comfortable customizable fit, as I immerse myself in music, podcasts, and my 6am Monday morning double bill of success. Session and Barry, so I don't wake the neighbours. Raycons allow me to switch between three sound profiles for both leisurely and active purposes. I use pure sound when watching shows to hear the crisp, clear wit of characters, while I use bass sound for warming up before playing dodgeball and tag rugby to really hype myself with the beat of the music. And then, of course, you have balance sound for that casual post-match cooldown. It also helps that Raycons are sweat and water resistant, removing the risk of damaging them as I perspirate or, you know, drop them in the sink while brushing my teeth in the morning because my clumsiness knows no binds. In addition to a 30-day satisfaction guarantee on all Raycon products, you can get two years of product protection insurance for just a few bucks. And with free domestic shipping or a flat fee internationally, Raycon makes quality and economical synonymous. With over 50,000 five-star reviews, you can support my channel today by simply going to buyraycon.com Ryan for 15% off your order. Personally, while I think The Last Exorcism does the commentary on spiritual hoaxes much better, as it blends its protagonist's crisis of faith with the exploitation of faith for profit and the moral debates around exorcisms and mental health, The Borderlands obtains much of its thematic strength from the human fallibility and complicated rationale behind faith that affects each character differently. But I'll touch on that later once we've established the overall conflict. 
At the core of the story, slow burn delivery is the relationship between Grey and Deacon. There's initially a tense awkwardness between them as they start out as strangers, learning to tolerate their personality clash. But as time goes on, they grow more endearing as Grey manages to break the ice with his sincere likability and open-mindedness towards the defensive Deacon, who slowly reveals more about his troubled past as the story progresses. Mark, on the other hand, is the arrogant, entitled asshole type who is so pencil-pushingly by the book that it gives both Deacon and Grey a common enemy to vent their frustrations against. They're not exactly the most complex characters, so don't go in expecting a deep character study or anything, but as is common with most British films, the style and its characters are reminiscent of kitchen sink realism, in that what you see is what you get, dodgy looking fish and chips included. I'm alright, yeah, just hanging with my homeboy. In other words, there's no dramatic conceit behind the characters, there's no big, quirky, eccentric personalities, they're believably upfront about who they are and embody ordinary run-of-the-mill people like you and I, and it ties into the very localised Mundian British attitude of kitchen sink storytelling. Part of this includes weaving humour naturally into their personalities, along with a cynical prickliness that never goes away. He cut his own eyes out. Look, okay, fine, I'll see this through, but then I am done. I'm going back to corporates. It's boring, but it's a lot less grief. When it comes to the actual investigation, the film generates most of its persistent tension by contrasting between two camera perspectives, head cams on each of the men to give us a sense of isolation and intimacy, and fly on the wall shots that fittingly create the feeling of these small men being watched by a larger omnipotent presence, tying nicely into the godly circumstances they're investigating. These latter surveillance shots also induce stress and misdirection as your eyes will be constantly scanning every inch of the frame, looking for some sort of nightmarish miracle just like the characters are hoping for. Yeah, I know for a fact your eyes are immediately drawn to this goddamn cross, it's always begging for your attention. Upon arriving at the church, we are introduced to Father Krellick, a young, naive, overzealous priest who takes severe issue with the group's skepticism as he's initially suspected of creating creating the hoax using subwoofers to cause the vibration within the church. The three men are tasked with different objectives. Grey's independently contracted to locate hidden speakers and tech equipment and assess data for any anomalies, whereas Mark and Deacon have a bitterly strained history of researching and investigating sites only to always conclude everything to be a hoax. Where the human conflict reveals itself is when Grey hopes for the video to be true, if not strictly spiritual, while Mark and Deacon refuse to even humour the possibility because they believe it does a disservice to the church by inviting false idols and misconceptions into their faith. Mark, in particular, shows increasing frustration at the idea of miracles because, despite his devotion to Christianity, he still sees himself partly as a man of science and rationale, and that the church needs to update its antiquated and alienating teachings so things aren't always taken so literally. In a significant effort to downplay miracles as an actuality, Deacon compares the hoax to a situation he investigated in Spain, where a girl was believed to have had stigmata, the wounds indicative of Christ's crucifixion, but was quickly discovered to have been tortured by her psychotic mother, who wanted to martyrize her daughter to make her a saint. Deegan then later briefly mentions an uncanny situation in Belém, Brazil, which will come into play at the end, where a group of Vatican representatives were sent to investigate claims that sick people were being healed by a shrine after having lucid visions of God. However, the representatives went missing and their bodies were later found with evidence of a plant-based hallucinogen called DMT, insinuating the visions were a result of being drugged, akin to that episode of The Simpsons where Maud's shrine causes mysterious convulsions because of a fucking gas leak. The rumour that persisted was that the representatives went mad after seeing God, with one having even torn out his own eyes, causing them to wander aimlessly into the jungle, leading to their deaths. Now, we have some wild Lovecraftian shit to get into, but just before we do, it depends on where you stand spiritually, but there is a tremendous amount of nuance to the discussion of being a committed believer in God, but rejecting this desperate need for physical evidence, as it conflicts with the concept of faith being a 
test of your worthiness to achieve sanctuary. The bigger picture of the story is that Christianity, an idea that was brought to England to replace paganism as the film later explains, is still an inherently individual ideology that means different things to different people, at least speaking for the characters and even my own experiences. Personally, I think the film has a very holistic discussion on the human side of faith, that being as curious creatures so intolerant to the unknown thrive on physical evidence to justify our values and beliefs, and so it takes a certain amount of courage and willpower to maintain such steadfast faith in the unknown. The point Grey makes as the relatable everyday layperson who arguably speaks on behalf of most of the audience is that, in his words, he really wants this big what if to be true because he can't be sold purely on the idea of shoulder shrugging ambiguity, whereas at least with pagans they worship what they actually saw before their eyes. For as complex and complicated as this whole discussion can be, all of this becomes intricately relevant to where the movie is leading, as strange and unnatural circumstances begin to occur around the characters. While Krellick is the first suspect of the hoax, the second suspicion is placed on a group of faceless youths who are possibly playing a prank on Krellick due to his susceptibility to obtaining any sign from God. However, something I noticed and it lingered in the back of my mind was the regular hostility that persists throughout with the youths feeling like they're borderline stalking the men and even tormenting them in places, while the locals eventually show their antagonism at the pub following a fatal incident I'll come back to shortly, all of which is subtly alluded to from the beginning when seeking directions to the church, only to be greeted twice by brooding dismissiveness. Do I think the locals are in on what's happening? I mean, they're definitely suspicious about something, as the three men are never made to feel welcome, with Grey even pointing out a dog killing and devouring a rabbit in the distance as this macabre motif for the place and life and existence itself. The youths even show their malevolence at full capacity when they set a fucking sheep on fire outside the man's house. The fuck is that man? Granted, the youth suspicion ends up being a red herring when it ends fairly abruptly after Deacon confronts them and just bollocks one of them in the face. Not so funny now, is it? Akin to The Wicker Man, the vibe is essentially this place is clearly not normal, and it doesn't take long until Krellick is seen trying to communicate with God each night to the distant cries of a disembodied child and a growling noise causing vibrations as if the ground is ready to swallow the church whole. Mark suspects it might have something to do with a hidden tunnel he discovers beneath the church, but before he can investigate, he's suppressed by a strange pressure to his brain that he dismisses as part of the altitude he faced when flying, but nah, it confirms there's something not right about this place. Alright, so at this point I can't go any further without getting into major spoiler territory, so this is your final warning. We won't jump into the big revelation straight away, we will have to build up to it because there is some information that's important to understand, but if you're ready for it, brace yourself. Eventually, Father Krellick leaps to his death after being unable to communicate with what he thinks is God, soon leading to Deacon contacting his Vatican mentor Father Calvino to exercise the church grounds. Calvino explains that before Miletus was sent to England by Pope Gregory in 600 AD to replace paganism with Christianity, the land the church is built on was itself worshipped as a literal deity that we can interpret as being reawakened by the christening of a baby in the early days of the church's reopening. The reason we can assume this is because the last time the church was in operation was in the 1880s, where a journal by the last minister, Dr. Pritchard Manville, explains that God told him in his dreams to open an orphanage. This village, a painted facade, he lies beneath, ever hungrier for souls. I may have a new master now. Yeah, the journal entries are not being cryptic about it, it straight up tells us what's going on pretty early into the film. Against Mark's belief in obscure antiquated teachings, the religious babble is being quite literal about the orphanage being a breeding and feeding ground for the deity. While attempting to purify the grounds, the deity does not take too kindly to it, and screams out in a bid to make the men go mad, causing Deegan and Grey to venture into the mysterious tunnels beneath the church. 
Down there, their fears are confirmed that babies were used in a ritualistic sacrifice to appease the deity, and venturing further along in an effort to escape, the tunnel gets smaller, more rounded, less natural, squishy and moist, eventually trapping both men. And, uh, there's no elegant way to put this, it's revealed that they've entered the digestive system of a FUCKING GOD. The film ends with both men screaming in agony as stomach acid melts them alive, with Deegan calling out the Lord's Prayer in a bid to find peace and forgiveness before both of them die. Our Father, hold me thy name! Oh God! Oh God! Uh, so yeah, uh, probably one of the greatest endings to any horror movie ever. While we can piece together what just happened, what lingers long after the haunting ambient credits with a delicately creepy choir song is that we never truly learn what exactly they came across. The brilliance of The Borderlands is that it explains what it can with the information the characters discover, but there's no explicit exposition dump to give you absolute clarity, so it's still large open to interpretation. Is it an eldritch abomination with untold powers? Uh, maybe. Is it actually God? I mean, it's possible since we don't know what God looks like. At the end of the day, the savage point of it to play back into what Grey wants here is your proof. This is your god. Fucking deal with it. I'm not saying it's the one and only, but until we know otherwise, which we won't, this monstrosity will have to do. Now, if we're being direct about it, it is greatly implied that the deity is purely the land itself, not necessarily some actual monster living under the ground, which in many respects makes it even more scary that the land we walk on, the place and home that we worship, can devour us at any time. However, there is one last point I want to make regarding Deacon and his last prayer that relate back to the Bellum situation that's briefly mentioned earlier. Before they enter the church one final time, Grey shows anger and disappointment at Deacon for not revealing the absolute truth about Bellum, where it's discovered that Deacon was the leader of the Vatican group and inadvertently got his entire group killed due to his insistence on digging deeper to discover the shrine hallucinations to be a hoax. Admittedly, it's a bit unclear about the full context of what happened, but it's suggested that the group were murdered to cover up Deegan's discovery that it was all a scam, which wouldn't have happened if Deegan had not insubordinately defied his duties. He lives with the guilt of what happened, but from the beginning of his investigation at Devon, he constantly shows himself to go against his orders to Mark's immense dismay, and as a consequence of his constant deep diving, he drags Grey deep deeper and deeper into the belly of the beast, along with Calvino when he asks him to purify the church. As a result, his last prayer isn't simply asking for forgiveness from God for his sins and trespasses, it's just as much Deacon begging for forgiveness from Grey and all the men who died as a result of his pride to prove no miracle ever existed. And that is The Borderlands, or Last Prayer, depending on where you live. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching, as always. Uh, please leave your thoughts in the comments below, including a request on what I should cover next. And until next time, stay safe, stay away from digestive systems beneath the ground, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye.